So for those of you who are just joining us, um, my name is Bill Cross. I'm the J. William Muir and Anastasia Vornas Head of Aeronox and Astronautics here at Purdue. And this is the second part of the Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series, a visit from Dr. Panina Axelrad from the University of Colorado. She's been our guest in Aeron Astro for today's PEDALS event. So we had a nice lecture from her about global navigation satellite systems and the future and evolution of those. And then what we wanted to do after that as a panel, a discussion with her and several Purdue colleagues about what are some things that might go on in the future? How can we use these navigation and communication systems both on the ground and in space in the future? So to do this, we've asked a graduate student in aeronautics and astronautics to be our moderator. So my job now is to introduce him and he'll take over the rest of the panel. So Siddharth, everybody calls him Sid, Subramanian, is a PhD student in aeronautics and astronautics here at Purdue. He earned his bachelor's degree in 2019 and his master's degree in 2021 from us here in Aeron Astro. In addition to his studies here at Purdue, he's been an intern at NASA, at SpaceX, and the Aerospace Corporation. He was also part of Purdue's Hyperloop team. He was actually the president and team captain for the third and fourth competition sequences. As a grad student, SIDS focuses in astrodynamics and space applications with an emphasis on using signals opportunity for orbit determination. So with that, Sid, I'll turn it over to you and the rest of the panelists. Thank you, uh, Professor Crossley. Well, today we've got quite a stacked panel, so I'll just do a quick introduction, and then I'm gonna have um, each of our six panelists um, briefly go over what their fields of interest are, uh, as well as what they find interesting in the field of GNSS navigation and, and communications. So first off, we have Professor Ayman Habib, who is the Thomas A. Page Professor of Civil Engineering. His research interests are in the area and or in the area of development application of air and space more mapping systems for smart agriculture, transportation, infrastructure, and more. Then we have Dr. James Garrison. Dr. James Garrison is a professor of aeronautics and astronautics here at Purdue and a uh, courtesy appointment professor of East electrical and computer engineering. His research and, and interests are in inventing new ways of using satellite navigation and communication systems for earth observation and remote sensing. And then, of course, our Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecturer, uh, Panina Axelrad, uh, Distinguished Professor at University of Colorado Boulder, um, whose research focuses on applications of GPS technology for uh, orbit and attitude determination, surface reflections, multi-path characterization, and much, much more, as we just learned from her talk. Uh, then we have Dr. Carolyn Free, who's an Associate Professor of Aeronautics and Astronautics, whose uh, field is in space domain awareness and space traffic management. Then we have Professor Insa Kwong, who's also a professor of aeronautics and astronautics. His focus is in autonomy and control of hybrid systems and control of multi-vehicle systems, such as networks of UAVs, satellites, and ad hoc sensor networks. And then we finally have uh, assistant professor of aeronautics and astronautics, David Arnas. His field is in astrodynamics, constellation design, mission analysis, and applied mathematics. Uh, so with that said, I'd like to um, start from um, that, and actually we'll start from you, Dave, uh, Dr. Arnaz, uh, I'd like each of you to give about a one or two minute opening on what you find interesting in the field of GNSS communication and navigation um, and, and sort of how your research applies uh, to that field. Okay, so right now what we are observing is that basically we are launching more and more satellites in space. And in fact, we have planned like thousands of satellites for the next uh, couple of years. And this thing is going to get worse and worse over time. So one of the one of the particular things that is happening is that these systems are not um, controlled entirely on ground stations because the number is so high that we are starting to need the assistance of GPS signals or other telecommunication signals. So as time passes, these systems are going to be more and more important for our future space architectures in space. And the reason for that is also that we are going to have to integrate the GPA signals and other uh, GNSS signals into the design of these space architectures for the following years. So I think that this is going to be a massive improvement uh, in the future and is going to, um, to change how we manage satellites in space. Dr. Wang? Um, my research area is not directly linked to communication, navigation, or surveillance. However, these CNS technologies are enable, enablers for the autonomy for various systems. We are in the aero department, so our systems are typically airplanes, spacecraft, drones, and many, many, many of them in many cases, including 
urban air mobility recently and traditionally air traffic control. And this, in this environment, without communication, navigation, and the surveillance system, system is not working. If you consider a single vehicle system, even then these enablers are very important. However, nowadays, not just single system, we fly many, many systems at the same time. It's not the centralized control, but everybody wants to do what they wanted to do while satisfying safety constraints and so on and so forth. So very accurate navigation and the timely communication. And then on the ground in the space, the surveillance system to monitor these individual vehicles behavior to safely um, manage it, the, their operations in the uh, airspace or in the urban environment, especially UAM, is very, very important. So uh, the, this CNS technologies, not only itself is very important, but also in terms of application of autonomy. Now everybody's talking about machine learning, AI and everything, but still, <laughs> These uh, hardware systems, CNS systems are very important. The uh, briefly mentioned at the end of uh, her talk that the integrity is very important. And I'm interested in this uh, cyber security aspects of uh, autonomy. And now internet of thing is everywhere. My cell phone is connected to almost everybody. It means that I keep telling where am I in some sense. Privacy is a problem, you know. The, and then how we can facilitate these advancing technologies in an intelligent way at the same time, how can we hide myself, ourselves in a sense that my private life is not exposed to the public in an evident way. So that would be very, very important. Thank you. Dr. Free? Um, yeah, there, there are so, so many of, of uh, aspects which are so exciting about the, the systems. Um, and for, for me, for example, the optical communication, that, that is really something that is up and coming. There have been few experiments so far, but um, we have the, the possibility to kind of have the higher downlink grades and then also be a lot more localized in, and not just spreading the, the signals around. So I'm super excited about what comes next there, especially not only in the inter-satellite communication, but also the, the downlink um, communication there. And I think we will see a, a lot of new exciting things there in the near future. Um, then, of course, in my research on, on the space debris, um, the, the MEO region has been relatively clear for many years because there was mainly GPS and then the, the, the Russian systems now as more nations are pushing into that. We also have kind of end of life considerations there. Also kind of what Penny mentioned in her talk that we are, want to have that connection to LEO. LEO is already super congested. So um, that will be super interesting because if, I think everybody feels encouraged now. Oh, if one company can launch 2,000 satellites. So uh, why don't we launch 3,000 in order to um, get, get the aims that we have? So that would be exciting times. And then the, the other aspect is, of course, communication in the deep space. There's a lot more push to go cislunar. And um, that was at the end in the question after you, after your talk. And of course, we do not have the GNSS as, as we know it from the near Earth space there. And um, we'll see what, what solutions um, will be there. Um, I, I do not think kind of the, the GPS around the, the, the moon, we also talked about that yesterday as the solution there. But yeah, how do, how do we bridge kind of that, that big space between the Earth and the moon or maybe all the way out to Mars and, and make advances there to have the precise measurements that we need in order to establish something as like space domain awareness in that region? Dr. Extra? Yeah. Um, the thing I, one of the things I've been thinking about, which is not fully formed, but the idea of uh, not constellations around the Earth, but sending out teams of satellites or, or maybe even UAVs um, where they create their own uh, network and their own sources of navigation, right? So if you, you sort of leapfrog or bootstrap your way out using a combination of GNSS and other signals, every time you communicate, right, you have the ability to measure range and to transfer time. And if you integrate that with, you know, decent clocks and inertial sensors, you can sort of create this moving, growing network of PNT sources. And, and I think that would be interesting to explore for um, interplanetary or planetary exploration or in the lunar region. And I, I think it also has relevance in you know, remote areas on the Earth with UAVs or areas if GPS is denied trying to, to use this sort of self-propagating infrastructure. 
Dr. Garrison? Yeah, um, as uh, uh, Penny mentioned in her talk, I mostly looked at using GNSS systems for remote sensing for extracting. I'll say science measurements, but you know, maybe it's broader than just basic science, but you know, applied measurements of the earth or properties around the earth that are related to um, things that we can measure by changes in the GNSS signals. So one of the things I, I think is interesting is that you know, the properties of that signal were designed for one purpose, um, which maybe you can you know, reduce on a fundamental level, level to, to measuring range and measuring speed. Um, but that enabled a lot of other measurements to be made because of basically, you know, th through those fundamental properties, we can make a lot of other measurements. Um, so where I think some interesting questions in, in, in the research related to this um, are going, when you get to look at other signals of opportunity, there was, you know, mentioned in um, your talk about um, spectrum interference and, you know, competition for spectrum, but uh, through looking at signals of opportunity, it allows you to make secondary measurements on a lot of these frequencies that are not allocated to that purpose. And in earth remote sensing, that's very important because there's a limited number of bands that you can make these measurements. So whatever, you know, we, we mentioned the L band is so good for penetrating through, through um, weather, um, it's okay for going through vegetation. But there's other bands that are optimal for other purposes, and they really have not been able to be used because they're already allocated for communication. So I think there's a, a possibility of opening up a lot of new types of measurements through this secondary use of existing signals. Dr. Habib? So uh, I'll just first start by saying a few words about where I'm coming from. I'm coming from the area where we do precise mapping or measurements using either spacecraft or airborne or vehicle-based systems. So the GPS or GNS has made a, a huge impact on our uh, actually field in terms of allowing the possibility to produce the maps without the need to establish ground control points, which was quite expensive. So we have this added advantage by having GNSS on our mapping platforms that now we can do very precise mapping using, I would say, reasonably priced services. So one of the exciting things here is actually is the proliferation of the applications of GNSS. So just to give you an example in terms of the applications, here we have the continuously operating reference stations of GPS or GNSS that allows you to determine the position of your receivers. Within the state of Indiana, 50% or more of the users, those ones are in the ag field. And that's really the, the major impact that we are impacting other fields, whether it's agriculture or transportation. And the exciting opportunities here right now that you have, let's say millions and millions of smart devices with GPS capabilities or GNSS capabilities, they don't have the same level of performance as what we have on high-end units. So the exciting here is that can you use this crowdsourced data by having this sheer redundancy of this GNSS data? Can you really get a product or mapping products which is very, very precise? Thank you very much. And uh, before I go any further, I also just want to remind that the audience is um, the way that we're conducting this panel. Feel free if you have any, uh, I will put forth a few questions to start, but if the audience has any questions, feel free to chime in. We don't strictly have a Q&A portion of this as well. But um, with that being said, I'll, I'll go ahead and start off. So uh, my first question to the panel is mainly um, kind of following up from the, the lecture series from earlier. Um, and I know some of you are itching to kind of answer this question as well. Um, on the topic of deep space exploration, cislunar space um, and navigation, what are some of the, 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 the groundbreaking new developments that you all feel are coming up in the next five to 10 years? And what particular advancements do you think will be necessary in mapping, remote sensing, formation flying, and control of spacecraft to enable navigation as we expand further and further out into the solar system? Um, I'll actually start, um, I'll start with you again, Dr. Arnaz. So one of the first challenges is going to be, for instance, to generate a kind of GPS, but instead of orbiting the Earth, orbiting either the moon or orbiting, for instance, one of the Lagrange points, because that will enable a lot of things at that point. The challenge with that is that this or sending a GPS a kind of constellation to the moon is going to be extremely expensive. 
generating a constellation around a Lagrange point. The problem is that it's not only very expensive, but also it's very challenging to maintain the same level of accuracy and the level of knowledge where the satellites are at each given point, because the, these points are not as stable as doing a, on orbit around the Earth. So these are like really, really big challenges that we have ahead. And, but I think that this is like the next step that we have to do in order to just expand our GNSS systems outside the scope of the Earth. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Huang, so um, kind of specifically going into your area, I was um, curious to um, figure out, on top of the existing GPS infrastructure that we have on here, what additional developments would we need in terms of multi-vehicle systems, uh, such as mostly in this case would be satellites, what advancements would we need to consider there in order to enable uh, navigation into the solar system and uh, other planets? Um, GPS, in, in aviation, GPS is one of the main sources for precise navigation, and uh, unarguably that's true. However, if you consider the not high flying airplanes, but low flying airplanes, or even ground vehicles, they are in and out of the environment we call the urban canyon or forest area where GPS signal is very unreliable or sometimes denied. In that case, suddenly GPS signal is available, now getting weaker and weaker and not available. And in and out of the building, for example, robots delivering uh, the lunch boxes nowadays, we, we see that, right? Then they are working very well on the open campus areas, but they get close to the building. It's not so reliable, just based on the GPS. What, they, what we typically do is that it has its own onboard sensors, active sensors, I would say, that camera sensors, camera is not really active, but camera sensors, LiDAR, laser, and all sorts of sensors are searching around it, looking for the obstacles and lanes and so on and so forth. That's why Google car is very cute looking. At the same time, it's weird looking too, right? It has a big head on top of the loop and it carries on these expensive, heavy LiDAR systems just augment not only the GPS, but also self-defensive. So sense of fusion type is very, very important. And in the academic environment, we are not typically using very expensive sensor, or we cannot use a very heavy sensor either because our UAVs are relatively small, even though it's big, but that big is compared to that big is, is really small. So payload is very important. Then if you keep adding these extra sensors, make the, the especially UAVs, the flying vehicles, uh, the, uh, not so useful in the sense that no more payload available due to the, all these sensors. So not only increasing hardware redundancies, but also increasing software redundancy is one of our areas, my area that, uh, okay, instead of using three different sensors, we can use only two sensors, but we have a software algorithm and intelligent algorithm fuse sensor information together in such a way that it can increase redundancies without using the hardware. Software typically does not have uh, any weight, but a lot of efforts done by the control engineers, right? So that's very, very important area. And recently, uh, Penny, you didn't go to uh, our the airport hangar yet, yet? no? Um, so we have done a lot of experiments in that area. Then the inside the building, we have very nice uh, the GNT, the CNS systems using cameras and it's millimeter level accuracy there. But suddenly it, vehicle get out of the building, it lost everything. And transition from even that accurate to the GPS accurate is very detrimental to the system if you do not consider when you design an autonomy algorithm. So that area is still a challenging areas and we need to look into to smooth operations of the autonomous vehicles around the world. Thank you, Dr. Huang. Dr. Free, so um, specifically related to um, space domain awareness and space traffic management in the cislunar domain and beyond, what um, advancements do you think um, expanding or having a kind of a solar system-wide navigation or planetary-wide navigation system, you think will, um, what will enable us? And could you also speak to some of the challenges that we would face to try and implement uh, that sort of network? 
Okay, um, I think it will leave the challenges to uh, <laughs> the people like Penny and, and Jim. Um, so for from um, space surveillance um, perspective, um, if we're going deeper into space, the, the Earth ground-based surveillance is not totally out of the window, but we are more restricted, kind of we cannot see everything um, anymore. So we will also have to augment the, the Earth ground-based system with kind of space-based sensors. And um, while I then can use, for example, passive optical observations, having a camera on my space-based sensor and then making those observations, I need to know the location of my sensor as precisely as possible. And there, it would be very beneficial to have something like uh, GNSS systems there in order to kind of pin down which one is my observer. Otherwise, I'm just stacking uh, uncertainties on uncertainties. Kind of, I, I'm uncertain about what I'm observing. I'm uncertain about my own position relative to the Earth. And then you see that that kind of degrades the solutions um, there a lot. So I think that's one of the challenges. And that's why I think from a surveillance perspective, that's why there is a push to, to have a source in order to pin down my own location of the observer. Thank you, Dr. Free. Dr. Axelrad, um, wh what do you feel about generally um, GNSS applications beyond the, the Earth domain and, and what we're seeing now and what do you think will, um, th does the research space hold in the next five to 10 years? Can I, can I ask, answer a slightly different question? Okay, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to, I wanted to go back to the idea of are we going to really put GPS around the moon or around Mars, right? Um, because I think GPS makes sense around the Earth because there's so many users, right? Billions of users, right? But when you have dozens of users or hundreds of users, users or even a thousand users, does it make sense to put up a constellation that's constantly illuminating the whole space, right? I don't, I don't know the answer to that yet. But um, what I was naively thinking was that you're, when your population is more limited, you might be better off with maybe a small number of broad transmitters and then point to point, you know, optical links or something where you'd actually have to point at each other. And this doesn't work for surveillance. It, it doesn't work for the things that you want to surveil, right? But it does work for the, if you just have a few nodes that you need to position that can help you and, and you can know where they are and they stay, they stay linked, with, let's say with optical links or RF links, you know, you get this point to point thing that gives you a framework, but not necessarily full 3D coverage and you integrate that with your dynamic knowledge. It seems to me like that would be a, an efficient way to sort of build it up slowly. Um, there's an interesting uh, technique, like it's called liaison navigation, where you have inter-satellite ranging measurements. And if you're in a non-linear enough dynamic uh, or, you know, space that you can actually get absolute positions from that or absolute knowledge from that. And that seems like you could leverage things like that in, in regions where you can have these kind of more distinct dynamics. No, thank you. That actually um, is very much in theme with the question, especially kind of the, what we're looking at for what we, what, what's within our capability within the next five to 10 years. A lot of that obviously sounds a lot more doable or, or, or effective, um, especially comparing, like, compared to deploying, say, a full-scale constellation around the moon or Mars. Uh, thank you very much for the answer. Um, Dr. Garrison, what do you see um, in the field of remote sensing specifically using signals of opportunity um, for applications beyond just Earth um, uh, using GNSS systems and networks um, and in general other kind of signals of opportunity that are that are present in the in the solar system or the, the universe? I know uh, XNAV is a popular concept as well, but but yeah. Okay, um, and I kind of answer a little slightly different question because I was thinking in terms of navigation. So I will say, um, with at least with cis lunar space, um, you know the the GPS or the GNSS transmissions, you know, even though they're designed for users on or near the Earth, um, they do extend quite a bit beyond the Earth um, due to the shape of the the antenna patterns and and all of that. You can. Um, I mean, it's been demonstrated, it's all, I think it's now operational to do GNSS navigation at geostationary orbit, which is above the GPS constellation, above the GNSS constellation. Uh, there's been theoretical studies, and I'm not sure if there's been an actual demonstration of using GNSS on the moon surface. Has that actually been demonstrated? Okay, it's actually been demonstrated. So, um, you know, I mean, it's not the optimal geometry, because you're kind of looking, if you visualize the geometry, you're looking at the 
GNSS transmitter on the other side of the earth. Um, but with 120 some satellites out there from the four uh, GNSS is that exist, um, you should get pretty good coverage in cislunar space just using the existing GNSS constellation uh, and putting the, the research into better algorithms for receivers, better ways of using that data, and that with the advantage of you have this infrastructure that's maintained and it's, you know, the integrity is being monitored, it's serving you know, billions of users, so it's, it's you know, part of the, the infrastructure and you can just use that out to at least the moon's orbit. Um, beyond that, you mentioned XNAV, uh, which I'll, if you're not familiar with XNAV, that's using similar concepts to how GNSS works, which is basically looking at the time of travel of an electromagnetic um, way from some known location to, to your, do, no, your location. Um, instead of using a signal that you are generating, you're using a very stable, signal that's naturally produced. It's from uh, distant um, pulsars, very well calibrated from these astronomical sources that are, you know, very long distances. Um, so, it's, you know, basically very similar to, to what we're doing with, with uh, GNSS on a basic level. So I think XNAV, there's a lot of potential there going, you know, beyond this lunar space. Um, so that was the answer to my question all about navigation. Now about remote sensing, many of the things with signals of opportunity can also be applied um, to, you know, to planetary missions that are gonna have communications links. I think an interesting historic note to all of this is that many of the things began in interplanetary missions. Um, radio occultation, uh, which you know, was, was mentioned, is now part of the operational weather forecast system. Um, radio occultation was first demonstrated in the 1960s in some of the early probes to um, the, um, the planets that have you know dense atmospheres like Venus and, and Jupiter, where they basically looked at making these measurements on the communication link back to Earth. And some of the first measurements of the atmospheres of those planets came from this secondary measurement along the communication link. Um, there was really no use to do, and this may be the inverse of the problem you just brought up, there really was no use to do that around the Earth because you know we know what the Earth's atmosphere looks like on the average, right? We wanna see those very small changes in the Earth's atmosphere that we know as weather. And in order to observe those very small changes, you needed a lot more measurements than you know, one or two fortunate links that happened to go through the atmosphere. So it wasn't until G GNSS or GPS came about that we had this distribution of, of sources that pretty much covers the whole Earth and gives us favorable geometry for radio occultation. So you might think things are first developed on Earth and then they move out to interplanetary space, but in many cases it, it goes the, the other way. And I can say the same thing about the, um, uh, the um, signals opportunity to buy static radar. There were also measurements made um, in the very early days of you know, lunar exploration, looking at the communication links that reflects from the moon surface. Um, so I'll, I'll just say, you know, broadly, um, yeah, if there's any, there's gonna be communication links, there's gonna be frequencies being used, um, and we could maybe do other types of science using them. Um, there's probably not gonna be the same competition for spectrum, but um, there still may be other advantages to reusing those, those signals. They're gonna put 5G on the moon, right? They're gonna put 5G on the moon, okay. 5G so. on the moon. <laughs> Dr. Habib, so it, regarding your specific field, what um, advancements do you think would be necessary to uh, enable mapping uh, precise mapping of specifically, say, the lunar surface, because I know as a kind of a national priority in terms of the space mm -hmm. policy, um, there's been kind of a big push to get back to the moon mm -hmm. and have a human, a sustained human presence on the moon. How do you see um, uh, precise uh, and uh, precise mapping applications on the lunar surface um, fitting in to um, GNSS? And, and what are the, the necessary advancements that are needed for that? So, so, I mean, the, the key part for us to do the mapping, we need be something beyond the location. So the position is important to position the mapping sensor, whether it's a camera, whether it's a LiDAR. The other part is the orientation, actually. So the determining the orientation in terms of azimuth or pitch and roll, if you have no gravity, then you need something else. So basically integrating the GPS with other, or positioning with other sensory data, like what Insoc mentioned, like, with cameras and LiDAR, 
and to improve the localization and the orientation of the sensor is extremely important. And that has far-reaching applications just beyond like the planetary mapping for indoor mapping, for mapping, let's say, in GNSS denied environments where you have no access to like a, to a complete GNSS signal, like in forestry and agriculture. So integrating the GPS data, even with weak signals, with sensory data like imagery, LiDAR, and other mapping sensors to improve the positioning and the orientation of your sensor is extremely, extremely important. Thank you. Um, before I guess I move on to my question, is there anybody in the audience that wants to ask any um, specific question to a panel member or? If not, I can, I can go ahead. Okay, so my, my next question, and um, I guess this one is just generally the panel, whoever kind of feels most passionate or interested in this one can, can kind of go first and we'll go around from there. Um, in the field of, of navigation, spacecraft navigation, and, and GNSS, what are some concerns that you guys feel are, are kind of cropping up? Um, I know from the, the lecture earlier, we learned that you know there's a the GNSS and GPS specifically has led to a lot of things that we didn't know were possible on the onset of GPS. Um, now, we talked about a lot of the benefits of that, but what are some uh, unfortunate, maybe not so great um, side effects that might be cropping up, maybe some not so great actors and how will they, um, what are some problems that might arise from this kind of renaissance of GPS availability, data, and navigation that we have coming up? Does anybody want to start that? Or <laughs> I guess I can point out. Dr. Ashra, I guess. Yeah, nobody knows how to use a map anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and professors complain true. about this all the time, right? So, <laughs> like, I do think it, it is hurting um, our brain development in terms of spatial, you know, ability to visualize things spatially because you go out somewhere and you don't even think about where, what direction it is or anything like that. So I, I think we're getting worse at that. <laughs> I know I am. I, I can certainly feel that too. Um. I, I think I totally agree with this one. And I think uh, going back to the statement that you mentioned, like, what would happen if our navigation system stopped working? That, that's really the, the big, big concern. That is a huge risk, yes. Yeah. And the other thing, and I'm, saying, I'm still talking about this from a mapping perspective, right now, actually, we have the positions. Sometimes we don't really realize how accurate or inaccurate the position is. So I think this is really very critical that you have to really make sure that we have this amazing understanding whether the signal we get or the positions we get is accurate enough for the application at hand, so th that's that's really very important, especially when it comes to this wide use of uh, navigation systems. The last thing which is also affecting my field a lot is that sometimes actually we just are users of GPS signal, we get the GPS position after integration with inertia navigation system, we say this is your position and the orientation. And we have just, okay, that's a predicted accuracy, but when we do the mapping actually, we figure out that the information is not really as accurate as we think it is. So having standards to really uh, clearly specify the quality of the products, that's extremely important actually, to make sure that you are using the right data for the right application. I think I have a question actually back to the panel, maybe to um, Jim or Penny who are working in that. So um, there has been a lot of talk about the, the different satellite system using up different radio frequencies and how that impacts kind of radio astrometry, uh, astronomy and these things. So um, what's what's the, the, the negative outcome, not only of the GNSS, but of the radio frequency use of the satellites? Yeah, um, when I give my talk on signals of opportunity, I introduce it and in saying, you know, the radial spectrum, it's it's like very valuable real estate. There's a finite amount of it and, you know, everybody wants to, to use some of it. So think of it as, you know, a finite resource that's being used up. Um, but I'll say a challenge in that is, can we use it more efficiently? And, um, you know, and I guess on the astronomy, we're, it, we're kind of limited because we're, you know, we're not controlling what, what the source is, and we, you know, we're seeing very weak sources. And, and in some aspects of remote sensing and, and radiometry, that's also the case. But if I, I talk just in terms of, of navigation, communications, and, and active remote sensing, 
Um, all of these involve just transmitting an electromagnetic wave, you know, governed by Maxwell's equations. But they evolved as kind of really different problems and different approaches, different languages. Um, are there, you know, on a basic research level, are there more fundamental ways of designing systems to optimally use the spectrum that's available? Um, so that's maybe a direction I would say that, that, you know, could be fruitful because there is a finite resource, just like, you know, many other things we're running out of it. Yeah, my question was is related to the original question, but um, and you mentioned this in your lecture. Um, there, there was obviously pushback from the NSF about putting the tool uh, that you had a uh, uh, putting the tool before the problem. Was there other pushback, I guess, historically to the infrastructure of GNSS on the whole? And like, can you anticipate some of those? Uh, I guess some of those uh, reactions in the future as we look to expand this this um, infrastructure to this lunar space. I, okay, I guess I'll try. Um, that's a great question, actually. Um, so my advisor in grad school was Parkinson Rate, and he he was constantly um, having to defend the project we were working on, which was not GPS, it was actually Gravity Probe B. Um, and he described that every year the budget would get cut for Gravity Probe B, and it was called a Washington Monument because what that meant was that people were so committed to actually doing this mission that when that got cut, they would put it back in the budget, right? So the Congress, they would sort of cut it knowing that Congress wasn't really going to kill the project. And I think GPS was sort of set up that way too, right? So by having this dual use civil military, um, everybody was pretty vested in it. And, and even I think when the budgets were tight, it kept getting funded or supported. It wasn't, you know, lavish. There were times, it, actually, there was a time when it was originally supposed to have 24 satellites and they cut it down to 18 to save money. Um, but after a while, it just, just like, it's too close to the bone. You might not always get four satellites. It went back to, to 24. So, so it was actually, people who put these things together were very politically savvy and they knew sort of what hooks to put in it that would make sure that it stayed popular with representatives from every state. <laughs> And, you know, going forward, I, it's a good, I don't see that the, there need to be future investments, but I don't see a massive, you know, influx of more support for it, uh, specifically, maybe for the lunar area, there's a different thing. It's, I'm going to let somebody else answer it. <laughs> don't, don't look at me. No, uh, <laughs> um, what, uh, what I've been thinking is, of course, if one nation then puts it up, there's the push that the other nations are following. So I think for, for kind of uh, Europe, it was always kind of a big thing, like, okay, we have uh, US and Russia, so if we want to be independent, if, uh, I don't know, they butt head against us and we're in the, squeezed in the middle, then um, that pushed that. And then, of course, we have the um, Beijou uh, um, constellation. That So I, I think it's also, um, yeah, one nation does it and get, gets kind of uh, a civil and uh, defense-related advantage, and then the other nations are pushing, pushing back. And I think um, that then, again, with limited resources and limited space, that can create some conflict there in, the, in that sense. I actually uh, kind of want to follow up with that to um, Dr. Huang and Dr. Arnas as well. Um, just kind of continuing along the theme of what general um, challenges do you see um, regula regulatory wise, such as through legislation or, or geopolitical with uh, the, the rise of navigation systems and kind of the, the, the deployment of, of new navigation systems by, by, by countries and also kind of going on our theme of you know, uh, various challenges, such as in um, location denied environments as well. Um, what are some of the kind of challenges that you see from maybe more the policy side that um, maybe we haven't run into yet or have not been implemented um, in, a, in a good enough way to address some of these um, rising issues? So at least the first missions that were launched in space, they didn't have any restriction regarding um, either signals or anything else. The problem is that one thing that people start to realize is that signals get interfered with other signals. So for, at least from my perspective, it was already a miracle 
that somehow we acknowledge that that was a problem and we try to find some kind of policy regarding that. So for right now, for instance, we have the problem of signals and we also have the, the problem right now of position of, of satellites because right now we are lacking also policies about that. In fact, right now everyone can place a satellite wherever they want. The only restriction is that you have to collide to something else <laughs> because that would be crazy. But apart from that, you basically can place anything on a space. So the problem is basically the first person or the first company that launches a satellite in space is basically earning or uh, gaining access and just them to that region of space. So this is something that was already happening for signals. However, the advantage that we have with signals is that that was at least regulated. This is something that we have to advance also for uh, how we place satellites in space because the density of satellites is getting really, really high. And basically now we have, for instance, a really big companies launching thousands of satellites that are basically buying regions of space because they are preventing other missions to have access. But we are not only seeing that because they just are placed on those regions. They are also um, taking these frequencies for, for themselves um, avoiding other people, other companies or agencies to have access to these regions and these frequencies. So this is something that even if right now we have like a very small number of policies around, around that, we have to expand those because the number of agents gaining access to space in the close future is going to increase very rapidly. So we will have to make sure that the sustainability of space is going to continue for future generations. Kind of continuing on that theme as well, um, this, this next question is kind of a, a bit more uh, of an opinion question. Um, seeing some of the kind of the, as Dr. Arnas mentioned, um, the growing constellations in space, uh, as well as um, other kind of cases such as the, the C-band altimeter conflict and the, the, Dr. Actually, I mentioned, gave a brief mention about Legato as well. Um, do you feel that some of these new advancements, such as you know the increase in uh, satellites in LEO, do you feel that the the benefits um, outweigh some of the risks that are being created um, with these, uh, in specifically in the field of communication, navigation, mapping, um, or do you feel like that it, you know the, the regulation is not adequate? Kind of in addition to um, what Dr. Arnas said regarding you know needing more regulation just on the number of satellites placed in space? I think that the problem is not that uh, we have to be constrained in the number of launches that we do, it's the way we do those launches and how we select where those satellites are located. Because right now it's like the Wild West out of space and we have to like be like clear of what, we do, what to do. Let's imagine that if we want to just park our car in a parking slot, what happens if everyone parks their car wherever they want it? The problem is that first, it's going to be very difficult to find a spot. And later, if you want to move a, a car, it's going to be very difficult to move the car around the parking. So we have to do something uh, similar to a space. So it's not a problem of that there is no space for that. It's a problem that we have to agree of what is a sensical manner of organizing a space. And this is also something that is going to be very important in the future. Another thing is that we have been starting to observe some satellites that are starting to bully other satellites. So this is something that has been observed in GEO because the positions are very few in number. So this is something that we also have to create policies on how to fight against these kind of behaviors, because right now, it's very difficult to try to fight again against a satellite that is doing this kind of action against other company or, or a country. So we will have to work on that also regarding policy. Yeah, I think tagging onto that, the, the, the short answer to your question 
is no, the policies that we have in place are not adequate. If we are thinking about kind of regulation, not only on the, on the frequencies, but kind of on, on the locations, uh, end of life considerations, the, policy, the policies are kind of from the 70s and from the 80s that are currently in, into kind of the Outer Space Treaty or the Moon Treaty and stuff. And um, kind of the satellites, especially in LEO, that, that was a very different deal back then, and we have not been able internationally to adapt those policies. We, don't, we keep talking about the 25-year the rule and stuff, and that's old stuff, and we know that's not sufficient, and it's not sustainable, but um, we, we could not, we have not been able in our international committees to move beyond that. I think another threat that has been coming up in recent years is also weaponization of space that we're seeing again. We have witnessed the anti-satellite tests. There has been a cascade of them. We have, as well as uh, India and other other nations, Russia, as of as of late. Um, we do not have any policies for that either. While several nations are also pushing active debris removal. Active debris removal means removing a satellite that is, doesn't want to be removed. I can also do that with an active satellite. So I think um, weaponization of space. That's, yeah, we will see a lot more of that, unfortunately, in the future, and we have no regulations in place for that either. Dr. Axelrod, so just kind of the, the going more in towards the, the, the actual, it, from what Dr. Free explained, it seems like we're still kind of in the wild west of space <laughs> um, applications and, and regulation. Do you feel that the current approach um, will yield more opportunities in the long run or do we does does it seem like we're we're really headed for something disastrous if if um you know uh, proper navigation constraints and and applications such as the um the spectrum uh debate that we just talked about um kind of controlling that finite resource if that if that's not properly reined in do you feel that again the the risks kind of outweigh the benefits in the near future do you see that happening kind of sooner or later? I'm going to stick with the net, with the non-spectrum part of the question. Yeah. Um, I mean, I agree I agree with what Carolyn said, that the the way that they're deciding who gets to launch what and what orbits is is, is inadequate, and, and that needs to be addressed. And there's astrodynamics committees that have talked about doing it, and I think it's definitely time for action on that, because we will see detrimental effects of it for sure. There's no... I think that's without question. I don't know how you, who you push on to, to do that, though. That's You need to find a different panel for that one. <laughs> but, but I mean, I think we don't, I mean, I think it needs to be coordinated differently. The, the requirements for demonstrating it and the broader risk um, profile needs to be evaluated differently. I think it's important um, and it won't become urgent until something really bad happens, unfortunately. But. Dr. Garrison, do you have any thoughts on the general risks of um, bad actors or other other things in GNSS and navigation going forward? I'm not really sure about bad actors. Um, one of the things I, I, you know, I am, you know, thinking about this, uh, you know, at some point, right, what, what type of regulatory structure will need internationally? And, and I'm wondering, um, you know, with aviation, I mean, it's just very tightly controlled even between, you know, countries that generally don't talk to each other nicely, you know, there's regulations and there's, there's an infrastructure there and you can, you know, safely fly between, you know, most points in the world. Um, I'm wondering what it takes at some point, I think we'll need to have something like that where, you know, you need a license to launch a satellite and orbit debris and collisions and all those are parts of the analysis of that license. And it's, uh, you know, a rigorous process. Um, and, you know, I don't know, maybe that won't come about till there's a really bad, uh, bad incident sometime and that motivates everyone to do something. That's usually how things work, right? <laughs> More reactive. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just, just tagging on to that. I think what we are missing, what we're having uh, in the, in the uh, air travel um, and also even with the UAVs in the, in the meantime is that we are adopting things into national law. 
right? I mean, we have um, we have kind of you apply for the license to to launch from kind of the country you're launching from, but um, many of the of the regulatory things that have been suggested in the scientific communities and in some of the international um, organizations they have not been adopted into national law of any of the spacefaring countries. And I think yeah, if, if there would be some some leaders there going going forward, um, yeah, we could do a lot lot more because every country is allowed to have their own legal framework um, and can control that and we do not have to meddle too many of the international waters and then we can do kind of adjacent countries like we do in air travel. But the, you know the challenge with space though right is you you can't limit them outside your boundary right the satellites go where they're going to go and so it's it I think it's an interesting philosophical question I guess maybe cyber is similar in some ways right because it doesn't respect boundaries the same way aviation is sort of constrained to, I suppose. But yeah, that's the part I don't get how to solve that one. Right. So um, we have about 10 minutes remaining. So I kind of want to do a, a, a rapid fire round, um, kind of ending on a high note through e each of our panelists. Uh, I want to ask, in your specific field of research, uh, or and through all the projects and various things that um, all of you have, um, what specific um, technology or project do you think that you're working on now that you that, that makes use of GNSS do you think will uh, that excites you and think will have um, a, a positive impact on on society and humanity and you know generally what do you think in your specific field through GN the GNSS enables will be able to uh, benefit humanity so um, we'll just kind of go um, end to end on this last round so we'll start with you doctor so, I mean, one of the key areas that we are starting to get interested in is using connected and autonomous uh, vehicles, actually, the data coming from connected and autonomous vehicles as a mapping system. So currently, most of our mapping is done by dedicated systems, which are quite expensive. They are, I mean, they are really not as expensive as they used to be a few years ago, thanks to GPS or GNSS. But the, the, the ultimate goal, or the, basically, is that can we really use consumer-grade sensors like what we have on uh, cars, like the connected autonomous vehicles, to do the really precise mapping. And can we really use the huge redundancy by the large amount of data with the low quality sensors to get as precise mapping as we get from high, our higher end systems? So maybe I can ask also one question related to this, to the, the panel that how far are we from saying that with these consumer grade GNSS receivers like what we have on cars or smartphones, can we really reach sub-meter or let's say centimeter level? Is this something that could happen or that's really far-fetched? Uh, actually, so we'll have somebody um, answer uh, Dr. B's question and then we'll kind of come back to the next thing. Does anybody uh, want to talk about, I guess, what will enable sub-centimeter or millimeter level GPS accuracy and not, not millimeter or mill centimeter, centimeter. centimeter. <laughs> from, centimeter. from consumer from yeah, consumer, consumer device. Device. Con device consumer grade devices I mean, a couple of inches would be still great <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I would say yes I wonder what you, would, you'd what say would that's in the cards yeah. take it to do that I, I would say you could do it I mean I think somebody sh the thing that the, the limits of phone is the antenna is lousy right mostly um, maybe in some environments it's hard, but if you integrate it with inertial, um, I think you could do it. Why not? But is it also one, I mean, the, the high-end receivers, they make use of reference networks, right? So we're, once we're connected with the yeah. phone, maybe if the yeah, reference Yeah, the phone's network, got the reference network. The PPP is right. going to come down. Okay. It's built into um, Galileo, and they're gonna, it's going to be real-time PPP, I think. Thank you. Kind of going back to the, the initial question that we, as you wrap up, um, Dr. Garrison, what application excites you most about GNSS for the near-term future, for the for humanity's, society's benefit? That, that I'm working on? Yes. Okay, well, I'm, I'll say maybe go a little beyond just GNSS, but maybe use of GNSS techniques with other frequencies. And I'll say that is the P-band signals of opportunity. And P-band is lower frequency than L-band. L-band is about you know one to two gigahertz. P-band is below. 500 megahertz. So um, the wavelength in P band is about a meter versus GNSS is about 20 centimeters. Um, and why that is so interesting is um, 
it penetrates into the soil. It can penetrate through vegetation, penetrate through weather. And so it's very useful for measuring um, in anything that's you know, obscured by vegetation or, or underground, um, specifically looking at water content in the ground. Existing techniques in remote sensing using microwaves, using P-bands are really not feasible from space uh, because of the interference that we talked about and also just physical optics will require an antenna 10, 15 meters um, using radiometric techniques. So um, I've been involved in, in the development of signals opportunity using P-band. Uh, we're about to have a, a space-borne demonstration at the end of this year. And why is that so important is because this the water that's stored in the soil is what directly impacts agriculture, directly impacts vegetation. They use the term root zone soil moisture. Um, it also is an important part of the water cycle for weather because it's the interface between what's in the atmosphere and then what's stored on the ground. And also can be useful for um, things like predicting floods, predicting droughts. So there's a lot of societal benefits. It's one of the most important environmental variables that um, is measured by remote sensing. Existing techniques at L-band and higher frequencies can only sense the first about five centimeters of the soil. Um, and so this is a new measurement that's not been able to have been made from space before. And if we can make it from satellite, advantage of satellites is you can make global measurements on a very high frequency rate. You can't do that with, with drones. You can't do that with in situ measurements. Um, so that's what I would say would be the one thing I'm working on that I think would have the biggest societal benefit. Thank you. Dr. Axtra, next. And can yes. I just pass on this one? No, that's fine. Yeah, we're kind of running close on our time too. Yeah, Dr. Free. Oh, wow, you get away with that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, there, there are several aspects. I mean, I'm, I'm super excited about CISLUNA and has space surveillance there, and there we are relying on something like um, GNSS type, type things. I'm not sure that benefits uh, society and, and the world as a whole, but that's why I'm excited. And then, of course, the debris problem of all the constellations are as, as well. Um, I mean, just, I think, um, with, with those Leo um, arms of, of the GNSS constellations, I think that will put more stress on the system. Again, that's not very positive, but I find it exciting because we need solutions there. We need them soon. Otherwise, everything will just crash into each other, and that's the end of it. So I think exciting times ahead. No, I certainly think as well, we, we may not directly see the, the, the benefits of it, but it's more of a problem where you'll you'll really regret it if we didn't solve it <laughs> so so the, would notice yeah absolutely so it's definitely just as important uh dr Mike. um so far we discussed about the uh, benefits from gnss systems and since our society getting more rely on such systems any misuse abuse could cause a COVID-like pandemic in our life. So my research area, uh, say from my research perspective, reliability, security is very important aspect of it. Again, we shared a lot of information together intentionally or un unintentionally. That can cause the, uh, the door that can be exploited by that entity, right? Then the, how can you make sure that such things can be can happen with extreme cost if not completely eliminated. So that basically practically infeasible. How can it do it? And uh, once we get that, then the uh, the uh, the intelligent transportation systems, smart cities, really uh, uh, realized. And I can see. Uh, my imagination is that within a couple of decades, it could be possible. But again, we have to resolve this issue. Otherwise, it's, it's, it could be disaster. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Dr. Arnas, in just a minute, what, in, in about one minute total, do you think, um, what research do you think um, that you're working on currently will have um, a good societal impact that, you know, makes use of GNSS navigations and communication systems. So for instance, right now I am working in satellite in space traffic management, but in the sense of how to create a passively safe 
constellation and space architectures. So the idea is to convince, uh, for instance, the Department of Commerce of other policymakers that we have to create a series of slots on a space in such a way that if a new um, agent wants to launch a new satellite on space, they can provide them like a set of positions in which they can fulfill their mission, but they still be safe with respect to the other uh, satellites in the architecture. So the idea with that is that we need like really good uh, navigation systems because every time that one of these satellites gets outside of these safe slots, we have to track it very well because that's going to alter the safety of the other satellites in the shell. The other reason is that imagine that for some reason a breakup event happens. So we have now a cloud of debris that is going to affect the whole shell and all the altitudes below that uh, breakup event. So now the problem is what do we do with the motion of these satellites that are going to be affected? We have to move probably a lot of them. So how we do that safely, how we control how these satellites are moving and how we organize this motion of all the satellites. So this is uh, what I am doing right now. Thank you very much, Dr. Arnaz. And with that, I um, we're, I think we're at the top of our time. We, we are, Sid. I'm just going to take over. I was going to thank you as well. So okay, if those of you, thank you for joining us online and in person. Let's thank Sid, Ayman Habib, Jim Garrison, Penny Axelrad, Carolyn Free, Insa Kong, and David Arnaz, our panelists today. Thank you for joining us today. And have a good afternoon. And I don't know what else to say. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>